Maya. I'm going to be talking about real-time analytics and building a service with InfluxDB. Um, if you want to like peek ahead at the code, uh, it's on GitHub. You can find it at that link. So uh, my background, I'm a data engineer at a company called Chatity. Um, our product is um, a tool that allows brands like consumer electronics brands to plug their existing chat system where they like answering uh, customer questions on their website. They can plug that system into our platform uh, via XMPP. So whatever they're using, whether it's like live person or OLARC, those little chat things you see on some websites that pop up they can continue using that same system and plug into ours. And what that, lets, um, what that lets them do is talk to their customers on websites where their customers are actually shopping. So like Walmart, Sears, Newegg. And so if you're looking at a Samsung TV, you can chat with Samsung. Um, and my work there involves building an analytics system. Um, we collect a lot of data to measure the impact our product has um, on e-commerce metrics. So like conversion rate, average order value, customer satisfaction, and just observing like how people are engaging with the product. Uh, here's a really quick demo. This is just a mock retailer. This would be like a list of products. This would be a product page. There's a little button you can click. And then you have this little Facebook style chat thing. So uh, we collect data all across the funnel to analyze it later on. I'm just going to close this. Uh, so that's just a brief tour of that. Um, so the overview of this talk. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, real-time analytics and explore a problem. Um, we're going to look at some paradigms and how to tackle the problem. And we're going to look at some tools which help you with the problem. Then we're going to dive into InfluxDV, which is another tool for real-time analytics. Um, we'll look at the features, how to model data with Influx, and issues to watch out for. And then we're going to take all of that information and use it to help us build a real-time analytics service, which is going to involve some live coding. So real-time analytics. Let's say you have a website and you want to count how many users visit your site and perhaps break it down by some other property like some referral campaign or anything else. But then you want to count this up for every minute, every hour, days, or months. Um, this is, there's tools out there that do this. But let's assume that like, we don't have Google Analytics at our disposal. We have to build this ourselves. So here are some approaches. Uh, we can write down every visit to our site um, to some tracking pixel endpoint. Um, so we send all the data there. We just write it immediately to a database. And then we can just query the data as it comes in. Um, or we can feed the data into a stream, which a process reads in real time and computes over like windowing things in real time. So there's some problems with both approaches. Uh, one, it, you're putting all your data into your database. You need to scale it. Um, that involves having enough disk, enough memory, enough CPU, whatever database you're using. Um, you're going to have to index by the fields you want to uh, look things up by or break things down by uh, in order to have better query performance. And that's going to slow your write throughput. So if you have a lot of data being written, it's going to put strain on your database. Um, if we look at problems with approach two, where we're processing a real-time stream, um, we need to write code that's going to count the data coming in, break it down for every combination of fields and time periods we want to uh, break things down by. So like minute, hour, um, day, and then by camp every campaign. Um, paralyzing the counting of this is a tricky problem. Like you could have like multi-processing and put things into queues and do the counting in different queues. But again, like once you, Python's not good at concurrency, you have the global interpreter lock, so it's, it's hard. Um, and then once you have this data uh, in your process, once you have your metrics, you have to put them somewhere to some other database which is going to serve them. And then you need an API to, to output your metrics. So um, one of the paradigms in building analytic systems is called the Lambda architecture. Who here has heard of this or read about it before? Anyone? A couple people? OK, so 
Uh, it was invented by Nathan Mars, who's the author of Storm, which is a tool we're going to look at. And the basic idea is that it's this way of architecting data systems uh, makes it fault tolerant, scalable, uh, resilient to human failures and hardware failures, and um, it should just scale easily. So this is kind of a high-level diagram of what it looks like. Um, there's five components. One is the layer at which your data is going into the system. Two is the batch layer where you're just putting all your data. Three is uh, taking like batch views, so basically just running queries on your big, big data set, putting it into some other system that can more efficiently serve that. Five is your querying layer, so your user interface, some API that's going to give you back your metrics. <clears throat> and then four is the part that we're interested in, which is the speed layer, which is basically going to be giving you metrics in real time. As soon as data comes in, it's immediately being processed and uh, being turned into metrics. And the idea is you merge together the um, batch views and the real-time views together to get a view of all of your metrics over time. So again, we're putting all the data in real time into both the batch layer and the speed layer, or real-time layer. Um, the batch layer has two functions, storing all the data, computing the views. The serving layer uh, indexes all the views, so you can query them. <clears throat> and then again, real-time layer is going to, in like low latency, compute your metrics. And then again, uh, when you want to do a query over now till whenever, like days from, uh, from today, uh, days ago, you can just merge the two views together. So that's a lot of components. Um, and the sort of meme that comes to my head is this, which is you have lots of different services talking to each other. It's, there's a lot of state in the system. It's confusing. It involves. Uh, you probably need a lot of uh, DevOps people to run this. But actually, before I continue, um, the ideas of the Lambda architecture, I think, apply to smaller scale systems as well. Like Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook are architected in this way. But sort of how you architect, if you don't have that uh, level of scale, you can still take these ideas of the Lambda, Lambda architecture where you have views of data, data is immutable. That applies at a smaller scale really well. Um, but back to the real-time layer. It's more prone to failure, as we discussed. Um, the reasons are the computation's happening in memory. So anytime your process crashes, whether it's like a bad deploy, or you run out of memory, or garbage collector slows down, um, all the state will be gone, and you'll be left without any metrics. Um, and then if your upstream data is just delayed for some reason, or uh, stops coming in, you just won't have anything. Um, so the idea in the Lambda architecture is that the batch layer is there to correct this. Um, all of the data is there, so you can build all the same views from the batch layer as you could in the real-time layer. And the data will be more, the metrics will be more accurate because you can deduplicate data, you can index it in different ways. Um, but one thing that the Lambda architecture doesn't really talk about is component one. Um, which is putting the data into both the batch layer and the real-time layer in a consistent way. Um, and Jay Kreps, who's the author of Kafka, wrote a really amazing uh, article on the, the idea of a log and what this does for data systems. So if you haven't read this, I highly recommend it. It's a great read. But basically, the idea is you have all these different systems. When you're at really large scale, you're going to have system-specific for specific use cases, and they're all going to need to um, transport data to each other. If you don't have a single log, you are going to have this crazy graph of, of data being transferred across. So the idea is everything goes through one source of truth, which is the unified log. Um, so again, in that case, the log has to be at point one, where all the data is going into the system both the speed layer and the batch layer have to uh, use this log to synchronize this, the data going in. Otherwise, they'll become inconsistent. So generally, uh, people use Apache Kafka, which is um, the project that Jay Kreps worked on at LinkedIn. Um, you could also use a queue, like RabbitMQ. But uh, Kafka is, is a 
way to go, really. Or Amazon Kinesis if you want if you're on Amazon. Um, for the bachelor, people use Hadoop. Um, they use MapReduce or Spark to build their views. Again, this could really just be any database where you just it's able to handle a lot of data and, and compute over it. Uh, for the serving layer, people use Cassandra or another SQL store, basically where you're taking your views and putting them in and indexing them. And then the real-time layer is the popular thing is Apache Storm or Spark Streaming, which we're going to explore. Unfortunately, all these tools run on the JVM, and Python support isn't the best, so you don't get access to all the great APIs they provide, and you, ha you have to have knowledge of running the JVM. So now we're going to explore um, Storm and Spark. So Storm, the idea of it is that it takes streams of data and allows you to process them so in a, sort of in a similar way that Hadoop did for batch processing with MapReduce. And the abstractions here are spouts, bolts, and topologies. So a spout is a source um, of data. So for example, like one Apache Kafka, the part where the data is coming in would be a source. Um, Storm has all types of sources you can use. Um, like you can, it just connects to Twitter if you want. It works with other queuing systems. A bolt is a processing step uh, that connects to a spout. So when you, if you want to count something or output it to a database, this is where you'd be doing it in a bolt. And then a topology is a network of spouts and bolts. Um, and what you do is you write your program as spouts, bolts. You compile it to a topology, put it to the, to the, to the storm cluster, and it starts running it for you. So you can actually use Storm pretty easily with uh, this library by Parsley called StreamParse. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Before this, there wasn't really a great library to use. And this is some code using uh, StreamParse that you could use to um, take your visit events and group them by campaign and by minute. So you implement this um, bolt class. You group your tuples, which are the, the individual uh, pieces of data in Storm. We create a group key, which is just the minute plus the campaign. And then process batch will count things up. Um, and then you can emit those uh, counts as tuples themselves. And then you'd have some other bolt, which would, which would write them out to a database. So just to summarize, I'm not going to run this for you because uh, we just don't have time. We've got lots of other things to go through. But as a summary, um, it's a pretty simple programming model. Parsley's uh, library is really great. It's scalable. It supports lots of inputs. And Storm is a very mature project that lots of, it was um, originally developed by Nathan Mars, whose company was acquired by Twitter. And Twitter uh, put a lot of work into it. The bad thing is there's no built-in APIs for analytical computation. So you have to do all your grouping, counting, distinct counting. Uh, on your own, you can use other libraries, but you have to be aware of how they interface in the context of Storm. So it doesn't give you anything there. Um, you're still going to need some service to store your metrics. Um, a weird thing about StreamParse is you have to configure your topologies with Clojure, which is a like functional JVM programming language model. <clears throat> um, so you can't do it completely in Python. You have to write some. JVM code. It's supposed to be easy to deploy, but you need to set up Zookeeper, which is a system that's going to store the consistent cluster state for Storm. That's another dependency. Um, I found a blog post on how it's difficult to productionize it. And basically, the issue was that if you want to update some configuration, like you want to switch a data, you want to switch a spout to consume from some other data source, like a new Kafka node. You really have to restart the whole thing. You can't just like switch over easily. So now we're going to look at Spark Streaming, which is a similar system that lets you easily build uh, streaming applications. Um, so Spark Streaming has this idea of D streams, which are connected to some input. So whether it's Kafka or Kinesis or a socket or a file. Um, it then gives you access to those and lets you do operations on them. 
So here's some Spark streaming code. Uh, in the beginning, you're just setting it up. Um, and then we're assuming that our events here are coming in from a socket. These are just some functions we're going to work over our stream. So here's where all the magic happens. We have the stream. We call map on it, which is going to, uh, which Spark streaming will take the process event function, distribute it, distribute the computation over the stream. Then you can uh, group your events by key and window. And what that means is uh, the data that you're getting is windowed by some time interval. So every 60 seconds, this group by key and window will, will uh, create streams of data where your data, all the data in that particular stream is uh, for a particular key. And it's going to happen every 60 seconds. And then for each stream, for each grouping of keys, we're going to count them up by their value. And then we're going to call map on them and persist the counts. So here you'd be writing code to output your counts to a database. Um, and you'll notice that this doesn't actually start until you say start. So this, this is sort of uh, your topology here if you're going to compare it to Spark. It's a little bit more simple. You're just writing some. Uh, so you're just chaining methods on the stream. So the nice thing about Spark streaming is Python works out of the box. It's all Python. Um, the programming model is way more simple than Storm. There's no topologies. You just chain your functions. There are built-in APIs for doing analytics, so counting, grouping, reducing. There's even like distinct counters like uh, that can handle lots of data. So you won't be using tons of memory, and it's scalable. You can just scale this up to however many workers or nodes you have in your cluster. The bad thing is it doesn't have access to all the APIs. So you can only use sockets, files, or Kafka in Python for inputs right now. Um, another weird thing is the PySpark library, which is what you use, isn't actually available as a Python package. So you have to separate that from your code um, that you want to test outside Spark. Um, the data gets processed in a batch interval, so it's not as low latency as Storm is. Storm just gives you everything as it comes in, whereas Spark was going to batch it up in a, for, in a more reliable way to, to make sure that your data is grouped. And then deploying it is a little bit more simple um, in that if, you have, uh, if you're on Amazon, you can use Elastic MapReduce, and it has Spark just installed on it immediately. So you can submit jobs to it. Um, but otherwise, you'll have to run it in standalone mode, which requires Zookeeper. Or you could, if you have Apache Mesos, which is sort of a data center clustering abstraction, you can just submit jobs. But it's still difficult to deploy if you don't have the tools. So let's go back to our problem of just doing analytics in real time. Again, we can write things down to a database and query them, or we can feed things into a stream, which given the tools that are available is a hard thing to do. So option one it seems more simple. Um, again, we're talking about real time, so anything for the last 24 hours. Um, what we could do is just use Postgres any, or any other SQL database, and we could shard data um, by day. So you write in all of today's events into today's shard, Tomorrow, you'll drop the shard or drop the table, and you won't have to worry about disk. Um, and the interesting thing is that InfluxDB, which we're going to talk about next, actually works this way. It indexes things by time, and you can set retention policies. So Influx is a new time series database. It's written in Go. It doesn't have any dependencies. So you don't need Zookeeper. You don't need Elastic MapReduce. You can just install it on a server. You can scale it to whatever size you want. Um, it does cluster also. Installing it's very simple. On a Mac, you can just brew install Influx. Or on Ubuntu or Linux, you just get the Debian package and run these commands, and it just starts up. The nice thing is that it's a single binary, so you don't have to install anything else. You just run it. Uh, you need a configuration file, but in my experience, it's one of the most simple databases to, to set up and get running with. So to use it, um, it uses an HTTP API for uh, writing data and querying data. So in this first curl command, we actually just write a, run a query, which is create database like real-time analytics. And in the second one, we are writing data to the database. 
um, in the form of InfluxDB's line protocol. So the line protocol is how individual data points get structured. Um, and it's just a string that you're writing. So the first part of the string is a measurement, which is like a SQL table. The second part, which is followed by a comma, is a sequence of tags and values. So these would be the, the properties of your data point that you want to index by. Um, then after that, you have fields, which are the actual measurements or values of data that you want to um, compute on. So like if you're count, it, it could just be a counter or some rate or something, something you sampled. And then the last part is the timestamp, which is in nanoseconds by default. Um, so InfluxDB has this idea of series, which is a combination of tags, uh, tag values and uh, measurements. So let's say we write to our visits measurement, um, the URL was index, the campaign ID was one, two, three, four, five, the value was 0.64, and here's a timestamp. What's gonna happen is, even though this is a single data point, it actually goes to four different series. So it's gonna go to the visit series, it's gonna go to the visits URL series, visits campaign series, visits URL and campaign series. Um, and what this lets you do is have immediate access to these different series. Um, you don't have to scan over the data to, to look to look up your analytics for uh, the index and one, two, three, four, five campaign. Uh, one thing you have to be aware of is the cardinality of your series. So if you have a lot of tag values that are just dis different, um, distinct values, that, then Influx is gonna store them all in memory for every series because it needs to know where to look them up. So you could potentially run out of memory if you had like infinite series, but it's pretty good at handling this. You can put hundreds of thousands of series in and it does it no problem. Um, this is how you query it. It has a SQL-like uh, query language. So you just select, run, write your expression, where what measurement it's from, what your tag values are, and then you can um, get the data back as a time series. So again, it's, Influx knows where to look up the data. It doesn't have to scan over it. It's just gonna immediately give you your results back. So it's very quick. But how do we handle lots and lots of data coming into Influx? Um, because you have these individual strings that are your data points, you can put as many of them as you want into an HTTP request. So you can batch them. And Influx also has a feature called retention policies, which you can set on your database and Influx will automatically drop data that's older than uh, a particular, than the setting in your retention policy. The thing that's important about this is that the data is removed efficiently because the data is grouped by time. So it's not going through all of your data points and like saying delete this one, delete this one, delete this one, delete this one, and then like removing them from disk at some point later in time. It's actually just dropping entire files. Um, but we still want some historical metrics. So we don't just want to get rid of all of our data after a day. Let's say we want like counts for days in the past or months in the past. Um, InfluxDB has a feature called continuous queries, which are like materialized view in a SQL database. So what you do is you create a retention policy um, to say how long to keep the data around for, and then you write a continuous query, which is going to do some aggregation from your series and then um, write it into another series. And this group by time indicates how often to run the computation. And then the star tells you how, uh, what tags to also group by. So your tags will um, come across. So this is a query which would count the distinct uh, users uh, for every day and then write it into another series. So in many ways, this sort of resembles the Lambda architecture because we have data going in to a single system. Um, we have a batch layer, like we can, we could keep all the data around and just run continuous queries over it into uh, downsampled views, which are more efficient to look up. But we also have a speed layer where we can just drop data and compute over it like in real time whenever we want. 
Um, there are some downsides to continuous queries and retention policies. The docs are sort of unclear on how to set them up. Um, but there is a good explanation on the mailing list. Another thing you can't do is backfill historical data. Um, but that's a feature they're working on. And if you want to query your data by different time zones, like because everything is stored as UTC and the continuous queries run in UTC, then uh, if you want to like query days by, let's say, Eastern time zone, your data wouldn't be correct. It would be windowed by UTC days. So you can't do that. If you want to do that, you probably want to sample your uh, metrics by hour and then shift the windows over. But then you can't really do exact distinct counts. So just to summarize, um, the nice thing about Influx is it's very easy to deploy. Uh, you just use HTTP to write your data and query it. Um, writes are very fast. The data gets immediately indexed. Um, there's a tag discovery API, which I can show you real quick. Basically, you can describe your schema and see what tag values exist and what tag keys exist. And this is useful for like building a dashboard where you just want to like give the user some options for things to, to drill down into. Um, deleting data is very efficient with retention policies, and you can downsample things. You're using SQL, so um, it's easy to just interactively query data in an ad hoc way. And there are some visualization tools um, that work with Influx like Grafana um, or Chronograph, which is a new one that, Influx, that the Influx team developed. And basically this plugs right in and you can just write your queries. It immediately lets you build a dashboard. Um, the bad things are there's issues with queries. There's some weird quirks like it's SQL but doesn't give you all the full power of SQL you'd expect from like Postgres or, or MySQL. Um, like I said, continuous queries and retention policies have some issues. Uh, expensive ones can cause writes to time out. I noticed an issue on the mailing list. Right now, clustering is limited to three nodes, um, but that's something they're working on for the next release. And just in general, Influx, um, the previous version, 0.8, was completely rewritten from uh, going to 0.9 because they just learned a lot in how to build this in an efficient way. There's a good talk on how they did it. Okay, so now we're going to get into actually building our real-time analytics service. Um, there's this Coinbase API which gives you orders in a feed via WebSockets. Um, so you can see what's happening in Coinbase in real time. So how do we consume it? Well, here's some Python code which is going to connect to the feed and just print out all the events. So we're just going to run this real quick. Uh, so you can see all the orders happening in Coinbase right now. Um, So the, we're just going to go through the, what the orders look like and then talk about how to model them. So there's limit orders, which have a price and a size. They get filled at the price or better. Market orders are just orders that get fulfilled immediately. It's somebody who just wants to uh, dump some Bitcoin. But they don't. Um, both of them have a side, which is either buy or sell. Market orders don't really appear, uh, so we're just going to ignore them. Um, but limit orders have four types. There's received orders, there's open orders, there's uh, done orders and matches, which are trades, basically. A received order looks like this. It's got these fields here. Open order looks like that. Again, the important thing is they have a side, which is sell or buy. They have a price and a size. A done order looks like this. Um, has a reason, so a lot of orders just get canceled or they were partially filled. And then uh, matches look like this, and um, they tell you how much how much Bitcoin uh, was traded. Oops. Um, so here's some metrics we want to build a service for. So we want to look at average order buy or sell price or size. We want to look at average trade price or size. We want to look at the volume, so how much Bitcoin has actually been traded over some time period, how much um, has actually 
been spent on Bitcoin, um, highs and lows, and then average spread, which is the difference between the average buy and the average sell price, which is a sort of indicator of demand for Bitcoin. So how do we model this? Okay, so we're gonna model it by order and by trade. So this order uh, event turns into this in the influx line protocol. So we have orders is the measurement, the side is sell, the type is open, the price is this, the size is that, and then we have the timestamp in nanoseconds. Um, this is a trade, so the type is match, where you write it into the trades measurement with side sell or side buy. Then uh, we have the idea of an uptick or a downtick. So an uptick is an order where the seller submitted it first and it was fulfilled by a buy order, or a downtick is the opposite. Um, these have a price, a size, and a cost, so cost is just size multiplied by the price. All right, so let's actually start writing some data. Um, so I've structured this into a flask app called RTBTC. Um, this is just a, this code here is just some boilerplate for creating a flask app and putting settings into it. And then I have this influx DB extension, which is just initializing the client with some settings. Um, so in extensions, I have uh, this proxy class basically just takes the influx client and passes the app config to it. And then you can start using it. So we're going to take this code, which is our Coinbase feed code, and write it into a new file. I'm going to save this as real-time pi. And now we're going to take this data, which Coinbase is giving us, and write it into Influx. So the first thing I got to do, and I'm just going to paste some code from the actual real code, just to for um, time's sake. So here we're just creating the app, importing the influx extension. Um, and then what we're going to do is the influx DB Python client doesn't, you don't have to actually write the lines out yourself. You can just write them as dictionaries, saying what the measurement, the tags, the time, and the fields are. And it's going to convert this into the line protocol for you. So we can just write the data, we can just transform the data coming from Coinbase into this format, and it'll, the client will just take care of it for us. So I've written some classes which just handle that um, in order to turn them into our measurements. So base order is just a base class, takes the data, says what the tags and time are, returns you dictionary. Um, order and trade are just extending it, um, just basically manipulating the data depending on what the type of the order is. So. In the end, we're just going to be initializing these with the data and put, giving it to the client. So now what we do, instead of printing the message, we're going to say data equals, we're going to load it, uh, message, and then um, we're going to say, we're going to write these in a batch. So we'll say points equals delist. Um, and we need to process the data. So. Uh, we'll say what the model is. The model will be a trade if data type is a match. Otherwise, it's going to be an order. And then instead of printing, we're just going to say uh, influxdb. Sorry. We have to initialize the data. So um, points.append model data dot to dict, We're turning it into the dict, and then if the batch size is fulfilled, we're going to write the, write the data. Uh, Okay, so let's try doing this. Uh, and um, 
before we do this point, right. Okay. Um, before we do this, we need to create a database and run the server. So I'm going to run influx and influx comes the shell. So we're going to create a database and um, the database comes the default retention policy. So right now it's just going to hold on to all of our data forever. But let's say we just want it for an hour. So we'll say alter retention policy default on um, uh, duration one hour. That's the lowest you can go. Say default. Cool. So now it's just going to hold on to the data for an hour. And the server is running. So now we can actually run this. Okay, so now it's writing the data. Um, we can just say select count price. Uh, sorry, use RTBTC. From. So there's been 188 orders so far. The time, it, if you don't say what your time interval is, then it just gives you zero as a timestamp, which is 1970. Uh, we have trades. Okay, so now that that data is being written, I'm going to do some exploration on it and look at some metrics. So we're going to create a new notebook and just do some um, imports. Oh, uh, we need NumPy. Okay, um, so now we have the influx client initialized and we can just start writing queries. So uh, influx db dot query, and here you just uh, pass your SQL. So whatever we just wrote in here, we can just count from trades data equals. So it gives you back this result set with our count. Um, there's only been 16 so far. So let's just do some quick, uh, some of our metrics we were planning on doing. So if we want to do the mean uh, price, mean order price, we can just do from orders. Um, let's say we want to do sell orders, so we could do where type equals sell and, sorry, um, side equals cell and the type is going to be open orders. So the mean overall is $267 for sell orders. If we want to do buy orders, we can just change it. And there we go. So it's pretty quick. Um, let's say we want to group these by time. Um, if we want to do a mean for every minute, let's say, uh, we can just do group by time, one minute. Oops, what did I just do? going to go into my other notebook and just steal a query from here. Um, I 
think I need a wear clause. Uh, I believe so. Okay, so you need to put a time uh, expression in your where clause. So we can just say what the data is. So here's our data group by every minute. Um, this is kind of hard to work with, but the really nice thing is that the Influx client supports pandas, so you can put your data right into a data frame. So now if we do data orders, whoops, we get back a data frame, uh, tail. So those are the average um, buy prices for the last five minutes. Um, we can plot it. I'm not sure why the axis looks like that. Um, for some reason, on buy orders, it does that. But if we want to do sell orders, again, it looks weird. OK. Um, so let's say we want to do total um, dollars traded. What we can do is sum over the cost of orders, sorry, of trades. Uh, we don't need the side. Ah, uh, yep. Still wrong. Found and from trades where? Okay, so this is our total cost. Um, so that's how much has been spent by broken down by minute. Uh, so let's, if we want to. Um, just automatically turn this into a series. We can use a continuous query. So the first thing we got to do is create a new retention policy. So we're going to say create retention policy sampled, or we're putting our sampled metrics into on our GBTC. Duration is infinite, so hold the data forever. And you got to say what your replication is since we're just running a single node with one. Um, so now we have this sampled retention policy. and now we can write our continuous query. So it's going to be create, oops, And this is the tricky part where you say what you're putting it into. So we have to say what the database is. And then you put the retention policy name, so sampled. And then mean order price one minute is the name of the series. We have to say where we're selecting from, so orders. And then we got to say where type equals open. Um, and then we say group by time. Um, case time. One minute, so this runs every minute. And we also want to put the side onto that. So that's print CQ, whoops, Python 3. Um, OK, so we can now just say influx db dot query uh, CQ. So something was messed up here. I'm just going to copy this because I already have it. Uh, cool. OK, so that's there now. We can do show continuous queries. It's there. Now let's write a query from it. So this part is a little odd because we have to put in the series. So we'll say, um,
Okay, so that did not work. Oh. All right. Uh, so now if we want to index this to get the data frame, we got to do mean order price one minute. Plot. We do tag should be a dict. Oh, we didn't do this on the data frame query. So there we go. So now we're using our our series generated by continuous queries to query the average uh, buy price by minute. Um, so another interesting metric would be to calculate the spread. Um, in order to do the spread, we'd have to query the mean uh, order price for buyers and sellers and then subtract the two values from them. So that would involve joining data, but joins don't work in Influx's uh, SQL dialect. So we have to write two queries. Um, but it's pretty easy to do this um, with pandas because you can just join data frames. So I will demonstrate how to do that. Uh, so again, we're just querying, this time we're just querying from the whole orders measurement, we're saying side is sell or buy, and we're just grouping by time. Um, and this should work. Nope. Uh, what did I do wrong here? All right, the next thing I'm going to show off is writing SQL can be error prone and you can't really compose queries. So what I've done is worked on a little library which is similar to SQL Alchemy which lets you generate um, the continuous query, uh, generate your queries. So the reason it's not SQL Alchemy is because Influx doesn't use a DB API. Um, it uses HTTP and the syntax is a little bit different so um, just for purposes of simplicity, I, I went ahead and just wrote this for fun. So we can just generate the SQL this way by saying query mean price as mean sell price from orders where type is open, side is sell, and then you can just call date range and it'll automatically fulfill um, the time param the time uh, where clause. So we can do And then this little extension just calls string on the query and, and uh, it generates it. So I think this should work. Uh, oh, we need date time. Okay, so we have those two uh, data frames. Head is not the best place to look. Tail, so there we go. Um, we can look at the buyers, tail, okay. So now if we um, join the two data frames, if we just do, we wanna join, uh, Where is this in my code? Right. 
So we're going to join the two data frames onto each other. Um, uh, DF equals that works, and now we get both uh, sell and buy price, and now we can calculate the spread for every minute. So we can do uh, apply, we're going to subtract the absolute value, so get, take the absolute value of um, mean buy price from Uh, um, so now we will get the difference in terms of dollars and we can plot it. Spread equals. So there you have it. Um, and if you want to look at the percentage difference, we can just divide by row. Ah, uh, whoops. Okay, so that's the percentage or the rate um, of the spread. Cool. So. The nice things here are we can just interactively query influx. We can um, compose our queries in Python and then get data frames back immediately. And just, this just makes doing analysis a lot easier and more fun. Um, so you could do this perhaps with SQL Alchemy. That's one thing I'd like to explore is writing an actual SQL Alchemy dialect for this. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is how to build an API that would give you these measurements back. So I've written some views here. This is just some boilerplate to handle exceptions. But the idea is that um, our views, which are Flask views, uh, they're for an individual metric. They take certain parameters, so start, end, end date, interval, if you want to group by time interval, in order to return your results back in. And then filters just can be any tags. And then you can just write your uh, queries with the query generator and immediately just give back your results in JSON. And you can like plug this into any charting library really easily. So to demonstrate that, I will uh, run the server. And you can see it here. So the data is already on the screen, but basically we're looking at the average order price between this time and this time. Uh, I will update this so that it's more current. So we're going to 16.09. Um, we're grouping it by interval again. We're looking at sellers. Whoops. So here we get back all of our data. It's all at the bottom. And now we have a uh, analytics API we can uh, do real-time analysis on. And that's all I got. Um, so I'll just go back to my slides. Thank you, PyGotham. Thank you, Chatterty, where I'm employed and have fun things to work on. Thank you, InfluxDB team and contributors for building an awesome tool. And thanks to all these people that I cited. And now I'll just open it up to questions and comments. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> there are uh, Docker containers built for Influx out there. Um, at Chatterty, we actually run it in Docker. Um, works pretty well. You just have to like put your data on a disk and then point Docker at that disk. But it's pretty easy to set up. Where 
so Elasticsearch, um, you have much uh, richer data or documents you're putting in. It's a document store so that you can like index. It will index a lot more for you. Um, you have a lot more flexibility in how you structure your data. Um, I played with Elastic like a year ago or something, and they had just released an aggregations API, but it's a lot more um, complicated to use than Influx's just SQL queries. Like you don't have SQL queries in Elastic, so it takes more time to compose like deeper questions. But you can do a lot of cool things with Elastic. You can do similar things like this. And uh, one, uh, Elastic is used for monitoring. Like you, people put logs into it, they index them, and then there's this uh, visualization tool called Kibana, which lets you view things. But I played with it. It the performance was a lot slower. Like it took more time to give you back your aggregations. Anyone else? Cool. All right, thank you. I'll be around if you want to chat. <laughs>